Uh, nice to thanks everyone. Uh, nice to nice to join uh, this this meeting of the uh, SBDI. Uh, yes, I'm I'm uh, Jeremy Miller uh, coming at you from Naturales in Leiden in the Netherlands. Um, uh, within the last few years, everyone this everyone can see everything all right, right? The screen looks good. Okay, cool. Um, so within the last few years, uh, uh, we here in the uh, naturalized biodiversity community have become very interested in automated methods of uh, identification of um, our uh, Dutch fauna. So, um, so, so part of that is, is, is based on DNA, but part of this is based on machine learning and, and, and recognizing, using computers to actually identify uh, organisms. So this is the area that I have become uh, interested in in the last few years. Uh, records of which species have been observed where and when are becoming increasingly critical to understanding our changing world. Machine learning is already being used by citizen scientists to contribute to our knowledge of biodiversity. Here are some examples of uh, insects photographed and identified using Ops Identify, a taxonomic application based on machine learning. Automated identification is already available for a variety of taxonomic groups, and it has no problem with these insects. Even when the images being identified are a little bit less than ideal, the app can be successful. But there is a large and diverse portion of the biota that is beyond the limits of what our ubiquitous smartphone cameras can easily capture. Such small-bodied, more diverse, less distinctive, and colorful groups are lagging behind. Uh, we, in my project, uh, we refer to this uh, group, to, to such groups collectively as little brown bugs. Libraries of images, the raw material for machine learning applications, are not currently up to the task. So here's an example of a staphylinid beetle. These are mostly in the two to five millimeter size range, often brown to black, usually inconspicuous, unless you're actively searching for them, uh, and can be very diverse and abundant. Here, Ops Identify is not so successful, suggesting with low confidence that this could be a damselfly or possibly a wasp. Here's another example, more confidently and erroneously identified as a cockroach. When we compare the number of digital records of which species have been found where to the distribution of described species across major taxonomic groups, some pretty clear patterns emerge. For one thing, about half of the records in GBIF are for birds, which only comprise about 10,000 species worldwide, a tiny fraction of total biodiversity. But arthropods, which make up more than half of the world's known species, are represented in GBIF by a comparatively modest number of records. It's worth pointing out that 2 billion records translates into only about four records per square kilometer for all forms of life across the surface of the earth, and two of those are birds. So this raises an important question. Do the taxonomic groups that dominate the global biodiversity data sphere approximate the general pattern of biodiversity and endemism that fits across all taxonomic groups, including things like arthropods? The answer is we really don't know um, uh, uh, the answer to this question yet, but there are some indications that should raise concerns. For example, a study in Australia looked at the total number of species for four taxonomic groups. Uh, insects, snails, vertebrates, and the plant family of Moraceae across a reasonably large area of wet tropical rainforest. The study was divided into 23 subregions and species present uh, for each of these four taxonomic groups in each subregion was determined. These data were then used to assess conservation priorities by ranking the subregions in such a way as to maximize the total number of species uh, uh, and, and, and rank the, each, each subregion uh, in that way. Uh, the question uh, can then be asked, does the ranking of these subregions based on one taxonomic group predict the ranking for the other taxonomic groups? In other words, can one uh, taxonomic group stand in as a surrogate for the others? If so, it might be possible to rely on a subset of taxonomic groups as a proxy for all biodiversity. What this Australian study found was that cryptic and diverse groups like insects and snails were good predictors of conservation priorities of vertebrates and fair predictors uh, for the plants, but that neither plants nor vertebrates did a good job of predicting the pattern of insects in snails. 
Um, and this is presumably because diverse taxonomic groups tend to have finer scale distribution patterns and higher local endemism than vertebrates and plants. So the taxonomic groups that have the greatest data deficit, such as the little brown bugs, may be among the highest resolution indicators of ecosystem change. Um, and this uh, uh, sort of uh, invokes some of the things that we, should, that we saw in, in Alexandra's, uh, Alexander's slide on IUCN data, uh, where again, we had um, a deficit of data on the most diverse taxa. And this is exactly the kind of information that we as a society are going to be increasingly relying upon to assess the impacts of climate change and other Anthropocene pressures on biodiversity. So the question becomes, how can we begin to address this data deficit? And can machine learning help us amplify our capacity to monitor biodiversity change in the realm of little brown bugs? So to explore this question, I've been experimenting with data covering a handful of different taxonomic groups. I'll touch on some of these later in the presentation, but I want to focus on the staphylinid beetle genus Stenus. These are typical examples of little brown bugs, abundant, diverse, small, taxonomically challenging. We selected seven species to represent a spectrum of taxonomic challenges. The challenges presented to the machine learning algorithm can be visualized as three nested triangles. The smallest triangle represents uh, three species that are challenging even to a human taxonomic specialist. The next two species are a bit more distinct, so easy for a specialist, but somewhat challenging for a non-specialist. And finally, uh, we added two even more distinct species that really anyone paying attention could figure out. So this gives us three discrete categories, difficult, medium, and easy. The numbers next to the beetles in the diagram represent the number of individuals for each species used in the various models and tests that I will be telling you about. And this will appear in the iconography throughout the presentation. So this chart is built on data from GBIF on the genus Stenus, broken down by data source. And the pattern shown here is pretty typical of a lot of taxonomic groups. What we find is that human observations records like those contributed through um, Ops Identify, iNaturalist and similar sites provide a very large number of records of relatively few species. Museum collections databases contribute a modest number of records, but these include many more species, and in particular, many species not represented by any other data source. So the challenge is to find a way to leverage some of the taxonomic knowledge in museum collections into a mechanism for more comprehensive and high throughput biodiversity monitoring. For this project, we used beetle specimens from the Naturalis Biodiversity Center collection in Leiden. Stenus beetles in natural history collections are typically mounted on uh, pinned cards or points and stored as dry specimens. We deliberately selected specimens with a range of preservation quality as opposed to just picking out the cleanest and prettiest specimens in an effort to get a realistic idea of both the power and the limitations of museum collections as a source for machine learning. Image like this. In addition, images of unmounted specimens from recent field work were identified with and combined with image libraries based on mounted museum specimens. Images from various online sources were identified based on the combined image library. We used the machine learning application Noose to build and test our models. So specimens were photographed both individually using a high resolution extended focus composite uh, image system and with multiple individuals together in a unit tray. Uh, individual extended focus images are much higher resolution and, and detail, but also much more time consuming to produce compared to images of multiple individuals photographed together in a unit tray. But this allowed us to explore trade-offs in time, effort, and performance. So the first two models I want to show you consisted of exactly the same 311 specimens uh, across these seven species, photographed alternatively as extended focus images of individuals or as multiple uh, specimens in unit trays. Uh, we annotated these data sets in NUS um, by labeling each specimen according to its taxon. The program then proceeds uh, to build a model based on these annotations. The program then tests a portion of the annotated specimens against the model to check to see if they can be correctly identified. The results of this test are presented in the form of a confusion matrix. And that is 
uh, that indicates which species in the test data set were mis misidentified as which other species. So presenting this data according to our gradient of taxonomic challenges, we see that both data sets uh, have a modest portion of the difficult category misidentified, but that the medium and easy categories were actually quite accurate. This is noose in action, identifying some test specimens in the unit trays. In this case, it makes three, three mistakes, two in the difficult category and one in the medium. Based on our modest data set, this seems quite promising. Effective machine learning applications require a large, though unspecific, number of images for each species. Scaling up to a much more uh, massive and broadly applicable image library would be a daunting if we were using uh, extended focus images because they're so time consuming. But given the preliminary success of the unit tray images, perhaps we could expand this effort. So we imaged the entire naturalized collection of Stenus, that's 55 drawers worth, using the same parameters as our unit tray images. We built a model for our seven species, now consisting of more than 4,300 specimens, and generated a confusion matrix. We have preliminary results from this. Unsurprisingly, the results are a bit more complicated. Um, uh, here showing the difficult, medium, and easy error rates. But for the next phase of this project, we are looking uh, for a relationship between error rate in the confusion matrix and how closely related species are. So the prediction here is that the AI should be more likely to make an error for closely related than for distantly related species. For this, we will be increasing our data size yet again uh, by another order of magnitude, focusing on all the Dutch Stenus species for which we have DNA barcode data. That's about 60 species. We hope that this will help us to better understand the areas where machine learning can provide reliable, high throughput taxonomic determination power and where we really need the attention of human specialists. So applying machine learning, uh, based on museum collections to biodiversity monitoring necessarily involves the identification of newly collected specimens. So we conducted a little field work and obtained samples for four of our seven species. As has already been mentioned, museum specimens of these beetles are typically dry mounted on cards. Freshly mounted specimens, freshly, sorry, freshly collected specimens uh, may be collected either dry or in alcohol or are not mounted. So, we explored the utility of our collections-based model to identify unmounted specimens, either dry or in alcohol. This part of the study was based on our individual extended focus images. In the world of machine learning, when you build a model based on image data sampled from one source and try to apply it to data sampled from a different source, you're dealing with an issue known as domain adaptation. Domain adaptation can be a challenge for artificial intelligence systems. And this was the case um, uh, uh, here, uh, our ability to identify unmounted specimens using our museum collections based library was quite poor. However, when we combined our fresh specimens with the museum collections library, the confusion matrix suggested significant improvement. So we built a composite image library using half of the wet and dry specimens and the museum collection images. We then used this more diverse uh, library to identify the remaining half of the field collected specimens and the results were indeed very promising. So I think what this suggests is that image libraries based on a combination of sources, including but not limited to museum collections can create synergies that ultimately lead to more reliable results. Extending this idea, we downloaded images of our seven um, species from some popular Dutch and Belgian human observation sites, as well as the bold DNA barcode database. We supplemented this with some images provided by the Natural History Museum in Rotterdam. And uh, this collection of test images is quite variable, both in character and in quality. The results, especially for the difficult category, are again, not very encouraging, however, when we split the library in half and use part of it for training, the accuracy uh, for the difficult species does improve somewhat. But clearly dealing with this freewheeling collection of images, uh, such as you can find scattered online, this is going to be a challenge. Now that previous slide was limited to images of dead specimens, as opposed to this one, 
uh, which shows much the same thing, but, but applied to posted images of living animals. Clearly, this will be yet another important challenge, uh, but very few images of the living animals are currently available on these human observation sites. So there's not much more we can do to explore these issues at this time. So far, I've showed you uh, uh, our libraries based on laboriously produced extended focus images of individuals and the group images of specimens and unit trips. But we are also interested in one other method of imaging collections. These are a few images taken using the picture eye conveyor belt system. This is a semi-automated system for taking high resolution multi-view images of specimens with much more modest requirements for human labor. So this could potentially be a best of both worlds solution to provide um, uh, high uh, quality and volumes of museum specimen images for machine learning libraries. Uh, it has the additional advantage of being the only option we have explored so far uh, where the data associated with each specimen are also captured. This has the potential for, um, uh, for filtering and querying specimens based on things like country, date, or identifier, and linking data and images to museum collections databases. Unfortunately, this part of our study has been beset with technical problems. We are aware that an unknown portion of the specimens in our museum collection are wrongly identified. So when we create models, it could be that there are a number of errors uh, uh, included uh, in, in our annotations. So if we think of machine learning algorithms as basically just fancy mechanisms for clustering data, uh, it should be possible for us to pick out specimens annotated as one species that are outliers uh, from most of the data and are actually much more like a different cluster. This is something I hope to explore further using the large uh, Stenus drawer level data set. Um, ultimately, I would like to be able to pick out uh, particular specimens in drawers that are indicated by the AI as being suspicious, send our beetle expert to check and verify these determinations. Um, our specialists, of course, just like every Atrisk Museum, uh, do not have the time to systematically go through 55 drawers of Stenus to say nothing of the much larger overall beetle collection. Um, but perhaps our models can make efficient use of this time to improve the accuracy of our collection. Here's one example from our drawer level images that we already recognized. Uh, the beetle in the middle doesn't really look much like the beetles to either side. And it would be very interesting if we could get the AI to discover this along with other examples not known to us. I just wanna to touch briefly on a couple other projects we're doing with machine learning um, with museum specimens. Here's one on spiders, which unlike the beetles are typically preserved in alcohol. So this represents a domain of museum collections distinct from dry mounted specimens. The spider study design is similar to the beetle study in its categorization of taxonomic difficulty. Tax, uh, the taxonomy of these spiders is traditionally dependent on characteristics of the genitalia. Reliance on genitalic characters is quite common in the world of little brown bugs. So we will be looking at both overall bodies and genitalic details. We're interested in whether our models can identify these spiders based on their overall appearance, or if like their human counterparts, they will depend primarily on genitalic characters to get it right. Another study is on bumblebees. Uh, this key group of pollinators is one of our most, uh, is really our, the most charismatic group that we're studying, um, and one with a lot of interest in various quarters. Uh, perhaps because of this, images of bombus specimens from several natural history museum collections are available online. So one of the things we want to learn from this study is about how to combine images from multiple institutions to build a composite library. This is in preparation for a future where natural history collections from Europe or the world are contributing to a common image library. Collections tend to be complementary, with some species that are rare or absent in one collection being common in another. So building libraries based on a consortium of collections will be key to making, most, or to, be, to making the most of our collective biodiversity knowledge. For this study, we will again be investigating individual images, drawer level group images, and uh, image uh, libraries that combine them. So automated identification based on images from museum collections material shows promise. Even in, a, even in taxonomically challenging small-bodied diverse groups such as beetles. 
We were surprised that our relatively low quality images uh, produced respectable results compared to the much more labor intensive extended focus images. Uh, this encouraged us to start building some very large image libraries that would have been unrealistically resource inten intensive at an individual level. This also allowed us to explore a much larger set of species. There are indications that building libraries based on multiple image types may be the key to the, to the development of a robust and broadly useful taxonomic tool. And uh, that's what I wanted to say about little brown bugs. So thank you for your attention.